I mean, I guess the way that people traditionally define IPE is that it's the interaction of markets and politics. We sort of look at the influence of markets on politics, but also the influence, of course, of policy on markets. You know, if you want to understand the world and you just look at economic forces, or if you just look at political forces, there's a lot that you miss. Economics tends to neglect the political factors that shape international economic relations. International relations study tends to focus on relations between countries, between states, between power relationships, and it tends to neglect uh, international economics. And that's clearly uh, problematic in a world that's becoming more globalised. The core of IP uh, is um, international money or international finance. In other words, what were the causes of the financial crisis in 2008 and the consequences of that. Uh, another area would be international trade and investment. What drives the globalisation of markets? What factors uh, shape the flow of trade and investment? Uh, it's also areas like environment, so international political economy of the environment. What impedes conclusion of a genuine agreement on climate change? Uh, these are not straightforward economic or political factors, but a, a, a mixture of the, both. You know, if you just look at politics, a lot of the things that we know about political structures and their outcomes that they produced are all kind of based on power. Um, and the traditional approaches would exclude looking at economics. They'd just sort of look at you know, military power or sort of con conventional ways of measuring, measuring who's sort of the strong actor and whether they get what they want. Um, by contrast, if you just look at economics, um, you know, that's something that explains a lot about how markets work but it doesn't really take into account power dynamics. It doesn't take into account political institutions, um, international institutions. So IPE sort of brings all of that stuff together, I would say. So substantively, we enjoy some overlap with what a lot of our uh, IR colleagues are, are doing. So um, this is clearest in the relationship between um, security uh, on the one side and then political economy. And we can see all kinds of instances, of course, where um, political economy and, and foreign economic policy is used to try to achieve uh, security um, goals. For instance, use of economic sanctions to try to um, change another state's security uh, behavior or sort of military um, uh, aggression, th those kinds of things. We also see things in, in, in the other direction as well. So uh, the creation of alliances sometimes with partners who might make for very good investment opportunities or um, become good trading partners. And of course that can be uh, uh, collaborative and cooperative, but it can also be dominating take the form of, of imperialism. If everything were economic forces, we wouldn't be in the like 12th iteration of the Greek, you know, of the Greek Eurozone crisis. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that politics explains, you know, the timing of or the sort of persistence of. In the general public debate about some of these issues, there tends to be a simplification or a particular slant put by governments or by interest groups. And what I think IPE can do is to provide an analysis of that and an objective assessment of the broader cost benefits for the economy, but also for society as a whole. There are relatively high opportunity costs uh, to working in the field of IP as an academic because typically and a lot of my colleagues could earn more money and, and perhaps have better working hours if they were to go in, into other fields. And so most of us that remain, I think, are very passionate about trying to actually find a way to do things better. Year after year, IPE proves itself to be worth studying. I mean, I got my first job in 2008, which was sort of right when the financial crisis hit. And, you know, I said to my classroom at the time, oh, there's no better time to be studying IBE. Um, and I say that every year <laughs> because it, it, it turns out to be renewably true. I mean, there's always stuff in the headlines that um, I think you understand a lot more if you do have an IPE perspective sort of in your, um, you know, in your arsenal. The Masters in International Political Economy at the LSE was one of the first that was established in, in the UK, in fact one of the first programmes internationally. Uh, I think the benefits it offers for participants is it gives a very broad understanding 
of how the international economy functions. So not, as I say, not looking at it from a narrow or relatively narrow economic perspective or international relations perspective, but it gives a broad overview. It provides participants with the tools they would need in order to analyze any particular policy area and understand the factors, the forces, the ideas that are shaping uh, developments in that particular policy area. So it's a, it's a program that's, I think, well appreciated by uh, in the public and private sector outside uh, of the LSE. So participants go on to work in government, in the private sector, in international organizations. After the end of the um, Cold War in the early 1990s, when people thought the Cold War was over, you had uh, scholars like Francis Fukuyama talking about the end of history and the sort of notion was that there, there wouldn't be another set of great debates because it seemed that the liberal democratic model had, had won. Uh, at about the same time, you have Alan Greenspan talking about a great normalization, that we sort of figured out how to um, run uh, macroeconomic policy. And then you have a series of repeated financial crises and um, debt crises. And we've sort of been between one, either in a crisis or just coming out of or just going into a crisis since the mid to late 1990s. And I think there's a much broader view now in, uh, or a much more broadly accepted view in IPE that a lot of what we thought we knew just isn't the case. A lot of our old tools and techniques just aren't working the way that we expected. And so on the one hand, it can be very dismaying and uh, challenging to us because we think, my gosh, we thought we knew what was going on, and yet it seems like uh, every, everywhere we look, the, the old, the old um, uh, maxims just aren't, aren't playing out. On the other hand, as an academic, it's extraordinarily exciting because uh, there's a lot of room for us to do a lot of good and, and to try to come up with a new way to synthesize all these, these new uh, anomalies that uh, we've been uh, experiencing.